Thank you all for coming. Uh, on behalf of the Joyce Z and Jacob Greenberg Center for Jewish Studies and to the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Chicago, uh, I welcome both the in-person audience uh, and our online audience to today's lecture and discussion. Uh, we build this as uh, the Israeli state and Israeli society after the October 7th attacks. Uh, our, uh, our guest speaker has honed in on, of course, a key dimension of this, uh, Gaza in the Israeli imagination. And our speaker today, and with whom you'll be from whom you'll be hearing, with whom you'll be conversing, is uh, Professor Arya Dubnov. Uh, Ar 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 Arik Arya uh, Dubnov is uh, an associate professor of history who holds the Max Tichten Chair of Israel Studies at the George Washington University. Uh, among his publications are the uh, greatly uh, respected and valued intellectual biography, Isaiah Berlin, The Journey of a Jewish Liberal, 2012, uh, and three edited volumes, uh, Zionism, View from the Outside, uh, seeks to put Zionist history in a larger comparative trajectory. Uh, Partitions, a transnational history of the 20th century territorial separation of 2019, co-edited with Laura Robson, tracing the genealogy of the idea of partition in the British interwar imperial context. Uh, and uh, quite recently, Amos Oz's two pens between literature and politics uh, from Rutledge, dedicated, of course, to the late uh, Israeli novelist, public intellectual. Um, and it, I'd like to simply add, and maybe this speaks, I think, to the, to the ways in which uh, Ari is a perfect person to help us think about some of these things. Uh, um, he's written many articles, one of which um, uh, uh, appeared in a journal I was then co-editing, Jewish Social Studies, a really brilliant article on sort of the politics of Israeli popular, the question of sort of where the 60s were and were not uh, in Israeli uh, popular and political culture. So uh, a, a cultural historian as well as an intellectual historian and political historian. Um, I want to add that today's discussion is the second in an ongoing series of events that the Greenberg Center is organizing to help shed light on the October 7th Hamas attack, Israeli responses, the Gaza war, the histories embedded in the crisis and the effects and implications of all of these uh, for Jewish and Palestinian inhabitants of the region and for Israeli society. The first event organized by the Greenberg Center, a Zoom discussion with Professor Menachem uh, Klein on the Hamas attack and Israel's war in Gaza, motivation, strategies, policies, and implications took place about two weeks ago and is available if you missed it to stream on the Greenberg Center's uh, Zoom channel. Thanks in part to Mike Phillips, who's bringing us uh, up to date at an important time to do so. Uh, our third event uh, after this one will take place uh, the Monday after Thanksgiving on November 27th. It's a Zoom event um, uh, on Israel, Palestine, war and democracy, uh, analysis and conversation with Dr. Dahlia Scheinlin, policy fellow at the Century Foundation and a, a prominent uh, political analyst. Um, both those events like this one are co-sponsored by University of Chicago Center for Middle Eastern Studies under the leadership of Professor Ali Reza Dustar. Uh, and we're happy to have that kind of cooperation. There's more to come. Uh, we will be think, uh, I think, be hearing from one of Israel's foremost sociologists, uh, Professor Eva Luz, uh, early in our winter quarter. Uh, so, and all that info and updates will be on our website. So, with that, let me uh, please join me in welcoming our speaker and conversant interlocutor, uh, Dr. Ari. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ma. Thank you, the Greenberg Center, for hosting it. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for organizing a, a beautiful weather that stands in striking uh, contrast with the very morbid situation we're in. Um, I will preface my talk by, um, as you just heard, my, my lens today will be that of a cultural historian. And, uh, and in a way, one could almost say that uh, I debated whether to add the subtitle to the to the talk to call Gaza between longing and uh, and heterotopy, uh, between some sort of a, on the one hand a, uh, an approach to Gaza that sees it as I'm using the Foucault in terms of a, a, a different heterotopy as the other land. It's the exact opposite. It's imagined as something which uh, is the opposite of what people uh, think uh, uh, want to describe Israel as. Uh, in a way, these images that probably many of you have seen are sometimes alluded to, to this kind of uh, uh, attempt to see Gaza uh, and the conflict between Israel and Hamas as uh, a fight between uh, good and bad, between defense and offense. Uh, um, and visual, and I decided to add a PowerPoint presentation for today's talk because visual uh, and textual cultural references play a big role in the way this imagination is constructed. But I will argue there is also sort of a, a different approach that is uh, captured perhaps best in the word, the Hebrew word kisufim and, and longing that has a double meaning in the context of the Gaza uh, uh, 
um, uh, strip, and I, I will talk about it later on. Um, so I am focusing on the Israeli side, and this is not because I am uh, silencing or eliminating the native. I, uh, my aim here is to uh, show the complexity and uh, multi dimensional ways in which the Israelis themselves are approaching the subject, uh, not to apologize them, uh, but just to, to clarify this. And there's always a pro and con to situations when in which, you know, panels in which Israelis and Palestinians are sitting together, there's like an ongoing expectation that each one will represent one side that, that does not allow you to show that there is a complexity within the, the, the Israeli side is not that homogenous in itself. Uh, and so on. I'll say I'll say very briefly a few words about the history, sort of the the hard facts to take this out of the uh, of uh, out of the table. Uh, and I'll show a few maps and dates. But this is not the key element for our discussion. It's sort of a, just to have you uh, coordinates. I will not talk today about pre-modern and modern Gaza. I will just want to highlight a few things that people tend to forget. You know, we when we talk today on the news about Gaza, we actually use Gaza as a shorthand name for the Gaza Strip, which is of course something that was created uh, as a result of the 1948 war. Uh, Gaza, of course, pre-exists and predates it. Uh, um, the uh, I will not be able even to talk about uh, the place of Gaza in Jewish memory before Zionism. Uh, it's uh, one can say that those who are stud, uh, scholars of Kabbalah perhaps are familiar with the name of Natan Azati, Natan Gazati, uh, and, and I sometimes mention it because the, the irony here is that he was one of the greatest supporters of Sabtai Tzvi, the false messiah. So Gaza in, an, in a Jewish imagination can be a topic for a separate seminar. Uh, uh, Gaza uh, is, would be often associated with the land of the Philistines, uh, where Samson was fighting them. So, uh, and I just want to mention one fact that uh, unlike so many places in the West Bank that the religious settler community will say there has a very kind of a deep seated uh, theological baggage that they carry, the cave of the patriarchs, Jacob tomb, uh, Hebron, uh, Gaza does not have, does not feature in the same way in, in traditional Jewish uh, uh, Jewish memory. Uh, and most historians of the Middle East, of course, everything is debatable, but a, a conventional way to talk about modernity in the region is to talk about the beginning of European interventions in the region. And many Middle Eastern historians will say Napoleon's campaign um, um, uh, to the Middle East, uh, the Egyptian uh, uh, campaign uh, is part of it. And yes, Gaza is conquered by Napoleon troops for a short while in 1799. Um, but this is also the beginning of a, a larger uh, shift in the region. The opening of Suez Canal really changes the location of the city, uh, of the Gaza city, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, commerce and trade and even tourism. Uh, in the 19th century, for instance, Gaza is a trade center for local products. One of the most famous one is the Gaza barley. Uh, so when beer production is modernized in Europe, Gaza barley is a famous kind of a product that is produced from there. And also bitter apple, which is kind of a medicinal, uh, uh, used for medicinal purposes. Um, and, um, and already in uh, World War One. Uh, the way the place where Gaza starts changing also its position. Once the British conquered Palestine in World War I, um, um, Gaza is, is situated slightly in a different context. Um, um, many of you probably heard about the Balfour Declaration of November 1917. Ironically or uh, poignantly, the Balfour Declaration is issued while the British are still conquering the land before Allenby and his troops entered the gates of Jerusalem. Uh, so actually on November 2nd, they're still fighting over Gaza. It's the third battle on Gaza. And Gaza is a stronghold of the Ottoman. Uh, it takes a long time for them to change it. During the British mandatory period, there's a Royal Air Force uh, uh, airfield in Gaza that all, even attracts tourism to the Holy Land. Um, so I mentioned because traditionally the Muslim geography, Gaza will be on the road to, to the Hajj. Uh, while now in the European context, it's kind of at the gate to the open 
uh, uh, to the holy uh, holy land and uh, and and uh, into the east. Um, but the key points are uh, I would mention, and this is where we'll really jump into the Israeli history. Are the partition plan of 1937? In a second, I'll show you the map. Gaza is is imagined as as part of the Arab state. Uh, but uh, the first partition plan is offered, as you can see here, in 1937 by the British. Um, but it's put aside, pushed aside for reasons we won't be talking about now. I can talk about it in the Q&A. But it's then reintroduced in 1946 in a radically different context after World War uh, two, and uh, now it's not uh, uh, put on the table of the United Nations and the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine also draws a different, slightly different uh, map. Um, and on October uh, 46, you will have uh, attempts by, by the Jewish agency to create 11 points. You do Aleph and Ekudot, this is the way the Zionist history refers to it. Uh, on the eve, uh, on the night uh, after Yom Kippur of, 94, of October 1946, 11 points mainly kibbutzim are established around the Gaza area, including in Gaza, including uh, one uh, place that is Kfar Dorom that I'll mention later on. Uh, and this is part of the preparing for what would be the future state uh, and the way in which settlement was used in, in this. I will return later on to the, the second part of the, uh, uh, of the slide where we'll go on in, in, in so just a few maps to refer to the, that refer to the things I just mentioned. On, on the left side, you can see the 1937 Peel Commission re, uh, report. Uh, you can see that Gaza is part of the Arab state. Uh, uh, the first partition plan of 1937 is a complicated history. I will just mention very briefly, this is a partition plan in which the British are not planning to leave the area in any shape or form. You can see this famous middle finger in which Jerusalem and the Jaffa port are still in mandatory period. So the idea is that we had, we today are talking a lot about two states and so on. It is in a way a two state solution, but it's a two state under the umbrella of the British Empire. And when partition is reintroduced in 1946, it already is radically different. And it's radically different because it's a quick and dirty exit strategy for an empire that is saying, I'm not interested in staying in the region. Uh, this is a liability, not an asset. I, I'm moving out. And you see that the maps are radically uh, radically different, but still Gaza is imagined as part of, of, uh, of the future Arab state. Jerusalem uh, should have been internationalized. And I mentioned the, Peel, the UNSCOP committee of October 1946. And this was in that context that uh, these 11 points were uh, established. I, I apologize that I found only a map in Hebrew, but you'll have to believe me that some of these points are some of the kibbutzim that were attacked on October 7th. So they date back to it. There are other kibbutzim and, and rural communities that were established around the area of Gaza uh, later on in the early statehood years. So names of very tiny uh, uh, places in Israel that, that made the news are going back to that period uh, period in time. And I will mention also one point, which is Kfar Dorom. Um, the, I highlighted it on the map. Kfar Dorom, literally southern village. This is in the area of the Gaza Strip. It's in very close to today's Deir al Barakh, which is a city next to Gaza. Um, and Kfar Dorom will become later on a symbol. During the 1948 war, there will be a siege of Dorom. Uh, when the war broke out, uh, the Southern Front was one of the most vicious fights between the uh, newly established Israeli Defense Forces and the Egyptian uh, Expeditionary Force. Um, fights in, in the South were, were uh, um, I will mention them in a second, because they're very important in the Israeli memory of the war and the way in which already in 1948, you had some sort of a connection between Holocaust memory and, and the 1948. Uh, war and Faldoron became a symbol. Uh, it was besieged for more than 200 days. Then, when the attackers, uh, the uh, the defenders of Faldoron, knew receiving intelligence that probably a new launch, you know, the Egyptians are about to launch a massive attack and they won't be able to survive it. They, they escaped in the thick of night and Faldoron uh, collapsed. But then, when in the 1970s Israel will reset, uh, send settlers to uh, the Gaza Strip, Kfar Dorom will be reestablished. And then in 2005, 
when Ariel Sharon will disengage, Father Rome will be abandoned. So there's like a memory that in a way offers a continuity, but the demography is very different. And this is, I'll uh, return to it later on. These are the photos that you see on the right is the 1948 Father Rome. And, and on the left is the 2005 uh, settlers that are uh, demonstrating that they're not willing to leave Father Rome. Pay attention to these orange colors that play a huge role in the uh, fight over the disengagement. Very briefly, of course, so I mentioned the fact that Gaza is a product, the Gaza Strip, as opposed to Gaza City, is a product of the 1948 war, and absolutely so. 1948, uh, um, 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 we won't be able to talk about uh, the Nakba in great detail. I will mention something which is critical to understand the Gaza Strip, which is not only the geography, but also the demography. Uh, Gaza City before 1948 is roughly 50,000 um, um, residents. This is the estimate. Um, and, but they're flooded by approximately 200,000 um, uh, internally displaced Palestinians. Um, and this is part of what creates the Gaza Strip, uh, both in terms of the map. So Gaza becomes like a tiny city within that strip that is full of refugee camps. Uh, those of you are familiar, uh, it's uh, mentioned many times in the news, those who read Mira Hesse, Hesse's uh, uh, famous book on drinking from the Sea of Gaza will know that a lot of those refugees will continue calling themselves by the cities of origins they came from. So they live in the Gaza Strip, but you'll ask them, where are you coming from? They say, I'm from Jaffa. I'm from there, I'm from there. So you will have this kind of 200,000 refugees that are in a way making the original uh, Palestinian residents of Gaza City almost a minority within that Gaza Strip. And just to clarify the sizes, this is tiny. The example I used yesterday, if you see the scale, it's, uh, sorry, it's a metric system, it's 10 kilometers. Um, I don't know if they're like, Marathon runners in here. A marathon is 42 kilometers. How much is it in miles? 20, 26 miles. You cannot, if you run from north to south, you cannot run a marathon in Gaza. It's 40 kilometers. It's it's not, it's just a bit less than a than uh than a marathon. And if you uh um, you know the the east west kind of the, the the farthest you have is is about you know eight miles. So the sizes of that strip are 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 tiny in terms of uh, 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 of its sizes, and the war that is fought in 1948, and this is where I'm switching gears to the kind of the cultural story after the after we moved aside the hard facts and the emotions, and the connotations, and the cultural baggage is very important. So. I mentioned the fact that in the southern uh, front, the wars were, with the Egyptian army were extremely vicious, very difficult. The Egyptian army uh, was able to invade up to the today's Ashkelon. To this day, there's a bridge in Israel that is called Geshel Ad Halom, which literally means up to this point. This is where they were fending off, and it took a long time to push them back. And uh, it was in that context that um, uh, the Gvati Brigade had its, for instance, very famous or for some infamous uh, commando unit on, on, on jeeps that called themselves the Samson Foxes. The Samson Foxes, the name was given to that group, and here's the cultural uh, references, is by Abba Kovner. Uh, Abba Kovner himself, a poet, uh, a, a partisan that really fought uh, the Nazis and had uh, 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 gruesome experiences during World War uh, II. And he is, uh, this is a famous photo when he's uh, briefing the defenders of Kibbutz Yad Mordechai. In a second, we'll talk about Yad Mordechai. And he is the education, um, we will call him officer, but it's actually education commissar. It's very similar to the kind of uh, ideology uh, uh, briefing to the soldiers and the combatants as they go into battle of the Givati Brigade. Those of you who are interested in reading more about it, I recommend reading uh, Shai Khazkani's uh, uh, Dear Palestine that is talking about letters uh, of soldiers, the everyday soldiers from 1948 war, and you can talk a lot about it. Uh, and he's using a strong language of A, biblical references. So he's coming with this idea of Samson's fighter. So connecting it with the biblical ideas uh, of we are like the fighters of, of, of Shimshon and Bo, Samson uh, the Great, but also with ideas of revenge that are connected to his old, own um, experience 
in uh, uh, in the Holocaust. We now have a lot of these texts that interest also literary scholars. Hanan Hevel uh, wrote beautifully about it. Uh, are uh, are very hard to read. You know, he's calling the Israel the fighters of the Samson unit to you know if you drive over dead corpses of of dead soul of Egyptians military know that this is like uh, you know and then comparing it to the Exodus of Egypt and so on. So this is a, a strong baggage, and I I, I do want to this this is a war that is takes place three years after World War Two, and Yad Mordechai is one of those sites of memory to use Pierre Nora's term, that is very kind of a prominent in bringing these two ideas together and just go to the, the, the kibbutz and you'll see the following. What do you see here? Yad Mordechai is named after Mordechai Nulevich, the hero of the ghetto, uh, the Warsaw ghetto uprising. So it's named so that the name of the kibbutz in itself was already carries the Holocaust memory in it. And it was one of the sites of the fiercest bite uh, uh, during the 1948 war. They left their water tower damaged War. So for an Israeli coming to that side together, it's these two things are merged together, you know, the, the trauma of 1948 onwards. But and this is where the but is important. The culture works both ways. So the culture was not only directing Israelis in the direction of revenge and connecting it with Holocaust memory. Uh, Abba Kovner, for instance, when the war ended, wrote a very famous, beautiful, modernist poem that was called Farewell from the South, which is actually also a poem in which the Israelis are acknowledging that there was a Nakba. And there's a, it's a long poem. I won't be able to produce all of it, but there's a, it's a, um, there's one passage that I, uh, uh, in a way, rings, you know, uh, disturbingly relevant for today, in which look at how he fuses European memory and the local scene. When he looks from here, there's no road, all is torn and cut in a sea of helmets that fell. This is from the uh, retreating uh, Egyptian army and the Israelis caps of hill and on every hill a gurney right so he connects it to the uh savage war civil uh, war in 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 spain and um just to kind of mention also briefly one of the most famous uh veterans of the fighters uh, of samson would be not no other else but uri avneri uri avneri will become later the most outspoken peace activist, a personal friend of Yasser Arafat. And this is the guy that wrote the unofficial anthem of the same unit. So this is where this kind of history plays both ways. So sort of a, the, and Uri of Neri had this kind of post-1948 conversion. Uh, um, um, and I can talk about it maybe uh, later on. Uh, I'll jump uh, right on. But when you look at the area, uh, the southern borders after 1948, mm -hmm. uh, you will see that also something very important that that's kind of where the Israeli culture starts thinking about Gaza in a different way. And uh, much of it has to do with what was called at that time, which is kind of regional defense. And the assumption, and that and, um, I reproduced your short excerpt from a speech Ben-Gurion gave to the IDF uh, cadets of the officers, of course, uh, the IDF, the assumption was that the military in itself, it's not big enough, it's not efficient enough to, to maintain Israel's borders. And the way to create, you know, uh, uh, to, to, you know, these porous borders uh, will need to be populated with more and more uh, uh, rural settlements, usually either development towns or kibbutzim. Um, and this is also connected, again, we won't be able to talk about everything, to intra-Jewish, intra-Israeli tensions between a more Mizrahi poor communities that are sent to development towns. So in the October 7th attack, Sderot uh, and Ofakim are two development towns, predominantly Mizrahi, working class, uh, and the kibbutzim, that are often attracting a uh, socialist, Ashkenazi, Zionist. Um, uh, a short um, um, anecdote, um, when looking in the National Library of Israel and in, uh, in digital archives about photos, um, uh, my wife's family was one of the founders of one of those kibbutzim, Kibbutz Mefalsim, 
Argentinian uh, uh, Jews. Um, I found this photo and that's her grandma. So it was unplanned. It was, uh, uh, and the idea that you put these kind of a rural settlements as possible, as closely as possible to the border is, was part of that uh, uh, of that uh, regime, and and um, and after 1948 uh, starts a period that Benny Moll is famously called as Israel's uh, border wars, uh, uh, in which um, um, Israel is is uh, uh, trying to fend off uh, Palestinians that are either trying to return to their houses uh, or to come and to do sabotage. And of course, in the discourse of Israel at the time, there's no distinction between the two. Everyone is called Fedayeen. Uh, and it would be in this context that this young gentleman, Ariel Sharon, that will play a huge role in the history of Gaza from that moment on, makes his first appearance. And more than that, a very famous or an infamous unit known as Unit 101, Yechida which is like an elite unit within the paratroopers. And they are there not simply to, to uh, uh, fend off the Fedayim, they are starting to do retaliation um, uh, commando raids into uh, Jordanian territory, into then Gaza was Egyptian territory. Uh, on the left is Meir Halzion, who was uh, uh, one of the you know, famous or again, infamous fighters that was part of that unit. Uh, um, it's uh, it's uh, that was very much developed uh, during that time in the idea. If it's not very good, in huge conventional military, moving mass regiments, but it's very good at these kind of a surgical commando units uh, that also have a different culture. It's not about discipline. You're not exactly reporting what you're doing. You're not exactly uh, telling your uh, uh, your immediate commanders. You talk to them in a first name basis. It's not the disciplined high, uh, military. Uh, and the, the, there was an ongoing debate about what's going on with these kind of units. Um, on the one hand, uh, Moshe Dayan, the chief of staff and later on minister of defense, liked the idea. He always said that, you know, I need the military to be a horse that I need to stop because it's ra racing forward too strong than, uh, rather than having a donkey that I need a kick in the ass because it's not moving. So he, he, he liked the idea, but even though we know that sort of Moshe Dayan was coming to Ariel Sharon and says, you know, you're a good soldier, but you really have a problem with truth. You're not, you know, reporting. You're doing things under the radar. It's a bit of a falanga type of behavior. And, uh, and there was ongoing debates about whether sort of a revenge is actually becoming part of the military strategy. Because often these raids were in response of a Fedayeen entering into Palestine, Israel, you know, making damage, create sabotage, uh, and, and they're retaliating. And this is an ongoing debate. The Mexican that is, really plays a really huge role in the history of Gaza is, of course, Moshe Dayan. And Moshe Dayan, uh, I love this photo, though it's from a later period, it's from 1967. Moshe Dayan and, um, 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 is, uh, um, his attitude towards the Israeli-Arab conflict in general and towards Gaza is, is a subject for an entire lecture I won't be able to talk about. I do recommend going, you can go online and find it. At, at, I think the Jewish Virtual Library has it. It has a very famous eulogy in memory of Roy Rodberg. Roy Rodberg was the uh, security officer from of one of those kibbutzim, of Nachalos, one of the kibbutzim that was now damn, it was, was uh, a site of, of, of a massacre uh, in October 7th. Um, and um, many historians, Israeli historians, including my colleague Moti Golani at Tel Aviv University, said Moshe Dayan really wanted, you know, was waiting for a pretense to to start. The night, you know, um, we're talking about 1956. It's the run up to the Suez Crisis. Israel of the early years is kind of a trying to keep it not clear where it exactly falls in the Cold War fight between West and East. By 1956, it's very clear uh, after the Korean War, it's very clear that Israel is kind of going towards the West. And the Suez crisis is, is a key moment in which kind of Israel uh, uh, has a, a secret deal with, with France and, and Britain that are interested in keeping the Suez Canal from being nationalized by Nazar. And Moshe Dayan is also needs kind of a, a pretense to, to invade 
and to launch a war. And in a way, I'm not saying that that was the only motivation of, of writing this famous eulogy. The famous eulogy that he wrote about Uri Rothberg became uh, um, um, very famous. But it's many people return to it today and for good reasons, both because of the geography, but also because the text is in a remarkable text in which he, unlike so many speakers today that turn history in, into mythology and turn politics into theology, Moshe Dayan, you can say a lot of bad things about him, was not willing to do so. And in the eulogy he's saying, it's not among the Arabs of Gaza, but in our own midst that we need to seek Ruiz's blood. So he's talking in the language of Midrash, how we did shut our eyes and refuse to look squarely at our faith and see that in this uh, brutality, the destiny of our generation, have we forgotten that this group of young people dwelling in Nahalaz is beating heavy gates of Gaza? This became an expression, the heavy gates of Gaza, um, um, beyond furrow borders, a sea of, uh, of hatred and desire of revenge is swelling, awaiting for the day uh, where serenity will dull our path, for the day when we will uh, uh, heal the ambassadors of Manavan hypocrisy, and so on. And, and one of the, uh, one of the uh, important elements in the speech is saying, I acknowledge the fact that in Gaza, it's uh, a sea of refugee and are full of hatred. And this is our destiny, to live on the sword and to see settlement, agricultural settlement and sword as two sides of the same coin, right? Um, and, and this is where kind of uh, uh, um, this text becomes very important, uh, uh, much more important in a way than, than I, I guess most of us even don't remember the Sinai campaign though Israel conquered Gaza for a short time and there was a brutal kind of a massacre of civilians in Gaza. And it was in that context that the Kfar uh, Falkassim massacre took place um, uh, due to American pressure. Israel had to withdraw very uh, fast from the Gaza uh, border. Ben Gurion was not very happy uh, about it at the time. It's also important to remind that in American audience that assume that there's like a linear connection between American policies to Israel all the time. It's completely, historically, completely inaccurate. Fast forward to 1967, Gaza comes back to, uh, to the forefront in a different period. And, and uh, when Gaza is now conquered, uh, uh, the, the, the topic comes to the, to the Israeli cabinet and there's a famous uh, debate or discussion in the Israeli government between uh, uh, Levi Eshkol, that was the prime minister during the 1967 war. You can see him next to Yitzhak Rabin, then the chief of staff. Um, and Golda Meir, who was then the uh, uh, secretary of Mapai, the party, and says, what will we do with a million refugees? And Eshkol famously told her, I hear you, you like the dowry, but the bride, not so much, you know. You want the territory, but you don't know what to do with these, uh, uh, with uh, uh, with the demography, with the population in Gaza. And there's great work that was done in previous in, in in the uh, last few years by numerous Israeli historians, uh, Ben Raz, uh, Omri Shefel Aviv. They're showing how after 1967, Israel tried to kind of square the circle in some way, in um, encourage resettlement. Uh, sometimes selective resettlement, uh, not necessarily massive resettlement, but aiming at young, educated uh, Palestinians. They are the troublemakers. Uh, you can encourage them or workers. So you have more chances finding jobs in Jordan and so on. But these kind of uh, uh, methods didn't really work. And very soon on, um, um, the Golda Meir government starts also saying settlement will be one of the ways of, of doing this. Again, I'm sorry that this is, I was not able to find an, an, an English map, but this is the black, uh, the, the darker points uh, refer to kind of a Jewish um, uh, Israeli, um, either towns or, or smaller settlements around the Gaza uh, uh, border and within Gaza. Um, and part of also what is going on is, is that there is economic uh, policy that wants to integrate Gaza into the Israeli economy. This is what sometimes is referred to as the open gate uh, policy. Um, I don't wanna go into economics because I'm a cultural historian. I mention it for a critical reason. Um, um, the image of the Palestinian worker, 
And this is where I'm always aging myself. I grew up in Israel that it was not equal, was not, there was a clear hierarchy, but we would go to a, you know, a restaurant in Tel Aviv, the waiter and the guy doing the dishes is most probably um, a Palestinian worker, most likely from Gaza. If you go to the fields and you were, you see the agricultural workers, many of them are in construction. It was completely clear. I have a good friend whose father from Ashkelon was working construction. Every morning he will come with his pickup truck and you know, dozen or two dozens of Palestinian workers from Gaza will work in the construction. Now, why am I mentioning it? Because people were rubbing shoulders. It was not, it was hierarchical, it was asymmetrical, but the, you, you saw the Palestinian. And this is something I cannot stress how important it is to understand, especially for the younger generation and the Israelis that are in their 20s, they never had that experience because all this cuts, you know, ends in the 1990s after the Oslo Accords and definitely after the blockade. So this is part of the hideous demonizations that we see today is connected to that uh, reality in which the Palestinian only sees an Israeli as uh, a soldier in the watch, you know, uh, 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 in a watchtower or even a drone. And the Israeli doesn't see a Palestinian unless it's the terrorist, right? So that's part of the reality that was, uh, again, I'm the last one to say that the reality before, before the 90s was lovely and, and, and beautiful and there was no occupation, but the realities on the ground were very strikingly different from what we see in the last 20, uh, uh, 20 years or so in Israel, Palestine. And it's not as if Gaza was only a friendly place. So Israelis would go into Gaza. It was famous for its markets. You know, you'll do your grocery shopping, great fish, furniture, and so on. You can drive freely into and out of the Gaza Strip. There's no border. Um, uh, but it was also the beginning of resistance. Uh, and and uh, one of the, uh, in, in the 19, in 1971, there was one terror attack that in a way was then used by, uh, as Ariel Sharon, who was then become the general uh, that is in charge of the Southern District, as to, 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 to do a very uh, brutal military operation within Gaza. And that was the murder of, uh, it was a, a case in which an Israeli family went on a weekend into Gaza and someone slipped a, a hand grenade into their car. Two kids were, were killed. Uh, uh, the mother was wounded, the father survived. Now, why do I mention it again? Take it, I'm, I'm just putting facts on, on, on the table. We can think about it. You see what I highlighted in, in red? It's not even the headline. It's not even the, the front page of Mari. It was, uh, but in that, that is the period in which I argue, Israel started looking at Gaza as something of a, heterotopic is is that place that is weird dangerous devious and um and and can kindly you know, mention the fact that i love popular culture and the article i i, I and and, and, and can did such a wonderful job as a, a great editor or one of my deep passions is uh, is israeli culture and popular culture and and alec einstein sometimes referred to as the soundtrack of Israel, uh, um, had a very beautiful uh, um, music album called Sale'at, literally means drive slowly. It's, uh, the Israelis in the crowd probably know it by heart, I'm sure. And there's like a scene and it's a beautiful, it's a famous song. He and his buddies, basically his band, are going to give a concert somewhere there in the South. It's not even clear what is it. And he's just saying, I'm driving, and what do I see from the window? Oh, it's heavy rain. And there's a scene in that, in, in that kind of ongoing dialogue um, in which I'm driving through the old car into the rainy night. And Tzvi, this is one of his buddies, Tzvi Shisa, and he's all in the song, Tzvi is always making weird, silly comments. It's kind of probably you know, too high on, on other substance that came from, from the West Bank after 1967, Tzvi says that they discovered life on an alien, on a, on, a, on a remote star. And I think, this is like Arik Einstein driving the car, soon we'll be next to Gaza. We'll pass next to Aza. 
Let's hope that uh, uh, some grenade won't be thrown at us and we will go to Azazel. Now, I want to highlight just for a second to talk about the Hebrew. Gaza is Aza. Azazel is that famous kind of a literal site where you would throw a scapegoat, you know, uh, uh, it's actually in the Judean de desert. So al Gaisan, knowingly or not knowingly, is using the similarity in the sound. And you now start imagining Aza as Azazel, as this hell. It's the exact opposite. I am just a musician driving a car. al Gaisan was trying to bring like the Beatles beat sound into Israeli culture to make it sophisticated, to make it more Western. And Aza is, is so near, but it's the other pole. It's this Azazel. And I would even say more than that, it's easier to imagine life on a remote planet, for Tzvi, than the Aza border that is hundreds of meters next to your car. That's the exact heterotopy. Now, why do, so this is why I like, you know, using, I'm, I'm not the only one that is using this Foucauldian term of a heterotopy, uh, 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 a different and the place of otherness. It's a discursive uh, 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 construction. It's not reality on the ground. Um, but I, I, I am mentioning it because I would argue that it's not the only voice that is appearing in Israel because at the same time, part of what Ariel Sharon would do is not to say Aza is a heterotopy, it's the opposite. Bring it into Israel and start encouraging settlers to move into Gaza. And this is the beginning of the Gush Katif uh, uh, settlement. This is a program that was famously called the Five Finger Plan. So the idea was to drive you know, settlements that will create like wedges between uh, Palestinian cities. Uh, the most uh, uh, northern one was uh, uh, and so on. Uh, remember Netzarim, we will come back to it. This most southern one, you see here only four because this is after the war, the peace treaty with Egypt. The southern one was actually also when Israel occupied the Sinai Peninsula. So uh, this is why you see from a later period the four uh, uh, points. And in the settlements uh, uh, in the 20 plus settlements that were built in Gaza, uh, it's not a homogenous population. Some, there's few settlements, especially on the Mediterranean, of, of people that were then evacuated from Yamit, which was a settlement in the Sinai Peninsula, that were not necessarily religious settlers, but the great majority after 1967 are religious settlers. And from their moment on, their cultural project is the opposite. So I would argue that while the the, the Israeli Tel Aviv kind of a secular Zionist like Alec Einstein is imagining Aza as the heterotopy, their project is almost the opposite. You know, bring it closer and start describing it as you know part of the Holy Land and integral part. Uh, uh, so this is where you can really see the uh, uh, see the uh, the split. And you can see the split growing more and more into the 80s and the first intifada and so on. Uh, again, I won't be able to talk about it in great detail, uh, but in the 1980s, at the eve of the first intifada, there was a very famous, um, I'm really aging myself here, a rock opera called Mami that was actually written by Hilary Mittelpunkt. Uh, it was actually against the first Lebanon war. And the, uh, the main protagonist uh, there is uh, a woman from a development, a Mizrahi woman from a development town uh, that, that uh, her husband is uh, wounded severely during the war. And, and she's kind of a, the one that no one cares about. And she finds herself kind of working in a restaurant in Tel Aviv. And there's a hideous scene, and I apologize for this, it really requires a trigger uh, warning in which there is a there is a dialogue and she's she's sleeping overnight because she's so poor in that restaurant and there are other seven palestinian workers that are there because that as i mentioned that was still the norm right uh and there's a very famous or infamous song in which they're about to rape and the dialogue in that song is very i mean of course very disturbing and she's trying to say I'm the Mizrahi, I was screwed up like you, 
I'm no one cared about me, and so on. And they're kind of answering in the choir, yes, but we're revenging the uh, 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 what you did to us, and you deported. I'm I'm uh, I'm reading from the uh, last uh, stanza. You de uh, you deported our children in the name of demographics. You stole our fields in the name of geography. You closed down our schools in the name of pedagogy. You called us Nazis and cockroaches. These are quotes uh, paraphrasing uh, Menachem Begin's speeches about the PLO at the time. You called us Nazis and cockroaches out of demography. So now we will F you the name of ideology. And that's kind of, it was a very strong anti, you know, uh, anti Menachem Begin, anti Likud um, um, statement that was, the young Ehud Banai and Mazi Cohen were there. You can you can listen to it on 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 YouTube and so on. And the first, the first intifada kind of in a way comes in in a way that that this is surprising. The Israelis don't know again what to do with the civil disobedience of such scales. And Samson makes a comeback. And Samson makes a comeback in the in the in the shape of these new units of what we call Mustalvim. This is what the American consumers know as the FAUDA, these kind of uh, uh, the, uh, you know, special commando units that are uh, infiltrating and dressed as Arab and, and, and uh, go into the unit. And, but I mentioned the fact that it was not a coincidence. Two units were established, Duvdevan and, and, and Shimshon. Duvdevan was working in the West Bank. It exists to this day. Samson, Shimshon was dedicated for Gaza. And again, you see how the theological language kind of is, is, is brought back uh, um, uh, as if from, from that period. And you see the heterotopy even growing. A cult movie in Israel of the 1990s is Operation Safta, Operation Grandma, Mivza Safta. Uh, it's a cult movie for people of my generation. Again, go, go and watch it. It makes fun of those kind of one of those uh, Argentinian kibbutzim in Otef Aza, like one of the kibbutzim my, my maternal, you know, my wife's family came from. Um, um, these are three siblings, and the, 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 the gentleman in the center is one of those uh, commanders of a Mistarev unit. Uh, and, and it knocks kind of the Israeli situation at the time. It's also a, a, a very fun criticism of, of kibbutz life and this tiny tight communities and so on. But it's the time of Oslo. They're like famous phrases in this kind of, a, uh, in the movie, you know, that the general comes to the uh, union. So you have this problematic situation called peace. What can we do? I need to postpone your, you know, he's eager to go in and fight. Uh, so it's a very uh, interesting satirical movie for many reasons. Uh, but this is where you really see the wedge kind of uh, between, you know, uh, a secular lefty kind of approach to Gaza and what was going on in Gaza itself in Gush Katif. And in Gush Katif, you created, the, the, the settlements created like a situation of, sometimes if you uh, compare it to Apocalypse Now, Netzarim was, in fame, was, was infamous in that respect. Netzarim, the, the expression of the time was Netzurim ben Netzarim, besieged in Netzarim. It was a, a, the, the idea of creating a, 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 a finger that will numerous settlements that would connect Netzarim with, uh, uh, with Israel uh, failed. Netzarim was kind of an isolated uh, settlement. You looked, uh, I served in the military at the time. Um, um, you looked at the map, it would look like a lollipop incredibly impossible to defend such a thing. One road leading to the settlement that was a source of endless ambushes, uh, booby traps. So the religious settlers, this uh, armored vehicle, if you, you're not miss, you know, reading, if you look that they're putting baby swallowers on it, this was the way in and out from the settlement, not only the level of once in a while, to school every day, to you know, to grocery shopping, and this was part of the situation that led Ariel Sharon to say it's unworkable, uh, and and he decided one uh, one hand uh, in one side to do the uh, disengagement. So Ariel Sharon plays a dual role, you know, in the memory of the religious settlers. On the one hand, it was the person that enabled the settlement in Gush Katif in in the seventies. 
and, and the same time, and with the same brute force, he said, pull out, move out, disengage, and did it in a one-sided uh, way, closing the borders of Gaza, creating the you know this blockade, basically closing the gate and throwing the key into the Mediterranean. Uh, um, and this is where a lot of the uh, uh, new discourse that we see exploding in Israel right now is kind of emerging. So part of what happened, and this is where I will again add a, a, a key word in Hebrew, the word longing, which is in Hebrew, kisufim. The gate leading to and out of Gaza, there were several gates that served for both workers and, and they were uh, and also for supply. One of the gates was called Machson Kisufim. Now, Kisufim is the name of a kibbutz. It's simply the kibbutz next to it. But the word Kisufim also means in Hebrew, longing. And the idea that suddenly there's like a border, you cut the place from your longing was very quickly picked up by settlers that saw the disengagement as a cut in their house. So one of, there's a novel by Tamara Avner, who uh, also uh, uh, served as an, as an officer uh, about, that is called Hitnat Kuyot, which is separations. It can be under, understood as both divorce separations, but also disengagement. So it kind of, she connects family novel with the situation on the ground. And she was one of the first one to pick up what was, you know, for a Hebrew speaker, you know, it's 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 a low hanging fruit to use this dual meaning of machson kisufin, a barrier to my longing. So the barrier to my longing was kind of a, 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 the the image of Gaza as something that we we are longing to return to is because something was whole was separated from us, and this is part of the discourse of uh, of those who are calling today to to return. Yeah, they're not seeing the war of uh, that started on October 7th as a war of defense, but as a war of getting back, returning, and reoccupying uh, Gaza. And they're using this language of, uh, of longing and return. But the image elsewhere was the, of what I sometimes call the Saudization of Gaza. And this is the heterotopic, right? So Gaza is the other. Gaza is called also controllable thanks to the combination of these elite units that are using very unconventional methods plus technology. Um, there's a great book by the historian Michael Addis, uh, Machines as a Measure of Men, and talks about how in many colonial situations, the side that has a more superior technology sees it as kind of a symbol of the superiority also in terms of civilization. And this is kind of a, the way in which this uh, 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 the situation from 2005, through this numerous operation and escalations uh, uh, were done, and also the rhetoric that was often used in Israel of maintaining the conflict and, and this hideous metaphor of mowing the lawn, that every once in a while, the grass grows tall, you need to come in and cut it. Uh, and that was kind of the, the, the image that, that exploded in everyone's faces on October 7th, when in a few hours, the Hamas fighters were able not only, you know, if you look, look at the size of the map, they triple, you know, almost the size uh, 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 of, of the Gaza Strip. Um, and, and, um, and, and we can talk about it, uh, about what happened on October 7th. But again, I want to talk really, and this is my final point, but was, was therefore, how can, given the history I just told you, why the reaction in Israel is so kind of a contra contradictory or has numerous uh, points. So one image that of course plays a clear role and it comes as not, not surprising is of course the illusions of, of Guernica and the Holocaust. This is a very famous Israeli uh, um, uh, from Russian background, uh, ex-Soviet uh, uh, painter named Zoya Cherkesky. Uh, and, and she wrote, uh, uh, this is one of the numerous kind of uh, images and, and there are a lot of poetic uh, expressions in which the uh, attacks of October 7th automatically were connected to Guernica or or, or the Holocaust, uh, uh, Holocaust itself. Among the kibbutzim in southern uh, in the southern area surrounding uh, Gaza, what the Israelis call Otef Gaza, uh, you will find a lot of the Ashkenazi 
and left center left leaning uh, population and they were actually engaged in the 40 weeks leading up to the attack in something else the massive demonstration in israel against the the, the legal the reforms or up, uh, uphill. And, and I mentioned, I used this poster. This is a poster that comes from the website of the Kibbutz Movement, United Patnoa Kibbutzi. Uh, but I also want you to notice this. So this, this it's a classic Israeli language. What is Savshmoni? This is the emergency bill that uh, when you uh, call up a soldier in a case of a war. Now, in October 7th, many reservists in Israel received the Tzav Shmoni. So they're saying, we need to go on the streets and demonstrate against Netanyahu's reforms. It's our emergency time. And, and you will not be surprised to hear that among those that, that were hurt, uh, the most severely, a lot, many of them were actually from, came from the most peacenik community in Israel. And they were engaged uh, uh, in, in, in this. And in a way, it is connected to their longer kind of kibbutz tradition that they saw themselves as sort of a, the border communities, but the border ends where the kibbutz ends. And this is not an empty metaphor. This is a slogan. It's a slogan that goes all the way back to Hashem uh, years to the last borough. It's ascribed. Don't go online because it's full of nonsense. Online, you will say, you will see people that are saying, Trumpledore uh, uttered it or rabbis uttered it. This is a classic, you know, uh, labor Zionist slogan. The border of the future state will pass exactly where the last borrow of the field that you're, you know, that's a kind of the pioneer imagination. You, you were working the field where the field ends. This is where the border will end. And for them, everything beyond the field was the other. Uh, and this is a uh, part of the conflict. If you don't believe me, this is the, uh, the entrance to Kibbutz Nachal Oz uh, that celebrated its 70th anniversary. And it says in Hebrew, Ad Patele Machalon. That's a famous slogan. You know, you need to uh, continue working the land. This is where you work, labor the land, the, you know, your energy is put, your sweat is put into the soil. This is where the country will, will be. And next to it is the Gvur Nachalo, the border crossing. So in their imagination, Aza is the other. It's not uh, a place of belonging, but for the religious Zionists that saw the disengagement as the break, it's the exact, um, exact opposite. And of course, you will see uh, among the uh, religious communities, uh, people that were automatically connecting it, not only with the Holocaust memory, but look what's happening here. This is Yochai Shalom Chadad. He's a filmmaker, a cultural uh, connoisseur, and also a poet uh, that is more associated with with uh, uh, kind of uh, the Mitnachal, the, the settler religious community. This is a poem that he wrote like two or three days after the the attack. The 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 written in the family WhatsApp group. I just explained for a second the, the, the name of the part of what was so horrific about the October 7th attack is that people were you know trapped in their houses for hours calling for help. And Israel, I always say it's not a startup nation, it's a WhatsApp nation. Everyone is communicating on WhatsApp. So people were reporting live on their messaging app that they're being butchered and no one was coming. The, so the, the army took them six, seven, eight hours to show up. And that was part of the trauma of, of the October 7th uh, attack. So this idea that it was uh, there, but the entire poem is an echo of a very, very famous poem by Dan Pagis about the Holocaust. So what is the famous original poem? And then we'll read the Yochai Shalom Chadad uh, poem. Uh, again, it's there are different um, uh, uh, translations in, in, into English of the Dan Pagis uh, poem, but here in, it's a it's a very famous poem about the Holocaust. You can see it in, in uh, carved on this monument on the left. Here in this card load, I am Eve with Abel, my son. If you see my my other son Cain, son of man, tell him that I. And it ends abruptly. That's the original poem by Dan Pagis, and it's a very famous poem, um, um, often recited and mentioned in, in Holocaust memory, you know, ceremonies, memorial ceremonies. He took that poem, 
and did something very interesting, but also telling. Here in this burned mamad, mamad is like the sheltered spaces uh, that that uh, um, uh, and a safe room uh, where all so many of the brutalities happened. You know, the families went into their mamads, and there the Hamas attackers came and butchered them in those uh, uh, safe rooms. Here in this burned mamad, I is with my son Abel. If you see my firstborn king, son of Adam, tell him, look at what happens here, that revenge, if only for one of my two eyes. Anyone understands what the last sentence, it's an echo of a different text. Samson loses his eye, right? So con connecting the Holocaust and Samson, this is what's happening here. Uh, an opening calling for revenge. And that's kind of a part of the debate is taking place in Israel today. And these are the images you will see on social media. So remember I mentioned the orange color, the orange color of the fight against this engagement, they were using orange flags also to say, to say that we don't feel already part of Israel. No, they're not using the, the, the Israel, the, the center left in Israel tried to reclaim the flag in the demonstrations against Netanyahu's reform. The religious settlers were using the orange color as their symbol. And you see more and more of those photos, soldiers on the rebels in Gaza. And this says, Gush Khatif Chazam. Gush Khatif, we return. Um, as we, just before going into the, into the lecture hall today, go online you will see uh, religious settler soldiers doing parashat shavua readings from rebels in Gaza, ascribing meaning, so connecting it to kind of a, a, a theology and a mass demonstration that took place on you know, uh, November uh, uh, 9. Again, you don't need to understand the Hebrew, Bibi Gantz, Am Israel Doresh, Kibush Girushi Keshvud. Netanyahu and Gantz, the defense minister, what the Israeli nation, that the Israel people demands is occupation, expulsion, settlement. That's a right-wing uh, demonstration. Now, but I want to pay you to pay attention to two things, visual and, and geographical. The location of the demonstration is a Rabin Square. Rabin Square, ever since the Rabin assassination, is associated with kind of these places where you, you know, the lefty are going to do their demonstrations, where there was a mass demonstration against the basic law that will take in the Rabin Square and so on. So it was part of the method of, you know, we are taking this issue and turning it into the center consensus type of thing. But the second thing is the visual image. The visual image is very striking. This is not exactly, you know, religious. You know, uh, this is like the symbols that need to appeal to the secular Israeli. Just, you know, uh, two girls with a flag. And again, part of the, the context we see is that the attempt of the Israeli center left to say, we reclaim the Jewish, the Israeli flag to fight for democracy. And here you see, you know, the orange flag is now connected into the Israeli flag again and says, oh, so this is the very, conflictual situation in which the Israeli public is, is here. And I will end by just kind of uh, dedicating this talk in memory of my, my wife's grandmother. She was one of the settlers uh, in Kibbutz Mephalsim. You see the before and after. On the left, it's her in her, you know, 19 or 20 years old, left Argentina as a good socialist bourgeois, came to Mephalsim near the Gaza border, these are the trunks in which she brought all her kind of uh, all her clothes. And as a good socialist, she said, I'm opening it. It's communal property and come and take it. And, and that's kind of the, the uh, Sara or Sarita, as we call her, um, macabre humor, that pass away of natural uh, causes exactly a week before the attacks on September 30th. And in a way, hideously, she didn't see her life project turning into a site of massacre. So that's where we stand now. Thank you. That's time for questions. I'm sure there are questions. There's also questions online. So I'm going to let Absolutely. you feel comfortable fielding your questions and I'll just see Absolutely. what's going on over there. Yes, please. Maybe I'll uh, turn. 
You go hit a swing in the head. Justin, I think it's so great that you talk about your research with historical continuity about this confusing, complex imagination of Gaza. Do you find any reaction today in this one imagination of Gaza as surprising or or do you feel there are any cases you're not able to trace some earlier historical moment? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question, right? So historians should say everything has history, nothing started. I think that nothing is, is completely surprising, but degree, volume, scale is surprising. So in a way, one would think, you know, sort of a part of what happened to the kind of radical right in Israel use a post-corona metaphor as the masks of rhetoric. We don't even need to hide. I mean, so the way that right-wing hawkish Israeli politicians are don't even think what it means and how it sounds outside Israel to say, this is not but too old. We are here to occupy. We are here to get rid of them. Um, so in a way, one could say, yeah. <laughs> You know these guys, and you read their, you know, what they were saying in inner rooms. It's not surprising, but the way that they're saying it so openly, so unbashedly, so unshamely, in a way, this is where volume and quantity does becomes a bit of a quality, right? So the, the ideas in themselves are not surprising, but the way that they feel so comfortable saying it is very alarming um and so um, among the israel so but on the author side again and it's and, and i don't want to create you know by complicating the the the, 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 the israeli side i don't want to come you to come out with uh, a, a false image that is a clear binary or dichotomy, right? So, um, you know, the, the goodies and the baddies, uh, uh, the righteous, you know, the, these liberal Zionists are so good and so on. Um, um, I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to, 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 to go in that direction. There was a set, there was a central element in the one of the most uh, prominent groups that were fighting the judicial reform called itself. Achim Lameshek, brother in arms. And many of us said, I mean, there's a problem here, right? So they're using a classic Israeli militaristic imagination. Oh, that's time to join forces against a common enemy. Before October 7, it was the hideous reforms that are coming from the ultra right. That was the shared, and as we defend, that was their language, right? As we defended our country in cases of invasion, we need now to defend the country against those who are trying to turn it into an authoritarian nightmare, right? Um, but this kind of military sentiment was a problematic, and it lent itself to the same groups saying yes. And I do want to go back and emphasize what I said about Israel as is a what's up nation. Because part of what sociologists will have a great time writing about it in the future, part of what explains the success of, for instance, the massive re demonstrations against Netanyahu's reform is the way in which the, you know these WhatsApp groups. You have your neighborhood WhatsApp group, and you have your even parents of the same uh, that send their kids to the same school have their own WhatsApp group. There are like numerous WhatsApp groups. I think that Israel in the crowd will will concur with. Me. You know, it's uh, now when there were demonstrations, hey, buddy, we have to go together tonight to Kaplan Street in Tel Aviv and demonstrate against Bibi Netanyahu. And it was almost you know, some people compared it to like, yeah, it's like a show. We meet every Friday. We chant the same things and we meet our buddies and, and so on. Now, think what happened on October 7th on the same WhatsApp group. So. On the one hand, there's a lot of beauty that happened in, in beauty in this awful, awful situation. Part of what you saw on October 7th is those WhatsApp group became where the civil society is volunteering, not to help, you know, many of them would help the military, send uh, gear and money to the troops, but great majority helped those that were evacuated. 
uh, help, you know, who is, is there a psychologist in the crowd? We have like 50 families that are tra with traumas now that are moved to a hotel in the sea, in the Dead Sea, who is the you know psychologist in the crowd to come and volunteer to help them? So it, you see actually this kind of a working both ways uh, after October 7th. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, yeah. Question from uh, Sitar Pizza Love England online. Uh, he writes, uh, all right, he referred at the beginning to Gaza as the land of the Philistines who were dispossessed by divine dispensation. To what extent is the current perception of attitude toward Gaza due to the post 48 situation and ongoing hostilities, or rather inherited from archaic mytho history by now deeply embedded in collective memory? No, it's a great question. And again, sort of, um, I mean, sort of two, I would, would try, it's a, it's a complicated question because I'll have to divide it in the answer into two parts. One is kind of the story of, you know, what is a Philistine in memory, right? And, and this is not only Jewish memory, it actually entered into European languages, right? We, we say the word Philistine to refer to someone who is against, is uncivilized and, 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 and has, finds nothing about culture and art. Now, this is not Jewish, it's not Zionist, it's European culture. It entered, I checked it, uh, <laughs> Matthew Arnold says it already in the 1820s, but it probably comes from an earlier uh, a text that already used Philistines in, 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 in German. So already in the 1820s, before Zionism, this image of a Philistine uh, that derived from the ancient you know, uh, uh, Philistines as something that represents opposite from culture is there is there now i don't think that the zionist um, um, imagination about the philistine was so simple at all part of it has to do with uh culture and and, and interpretation so in hebrew plisha invasion and plishtim are connected uh the philistines were seen as a foreign actually sometimes european group that that settled on the on the um, uh, on the on the coastal plain. Why do I mention it? I I, I noted I, I didn't have the time to talk about it. There's a very important novel by Vladimir Zabrzebutinsky called Samson, and that tells the story of Samson fighting who the Philistines. Now, it's a great novel with all the problems. I read it as an allegory about the situation in Mandatory Palestine, and there's a key scene in that novel in which Samson is captured by the Philistines and he's shackled and he still can't see because they haven't yet take, took out his eyes. And as much as he hates them, he admires them. Why? Look at them. They actually, in his imagination, they're not the Philistines as counterculture. They have order. They have discipline. They have ranks. And this is about, and my reading of that allegory is that, no, this is Zobotinsky looking at the British military. There, here comes an empire, a European force. I have my problems with them, but actually I do admire the rank and file and the order and all. So even in the Israeli right, Philistines, it's not so simple. It's not, it's much more complicated. So it's not necessarily the way in which many contemporary religious settlers that will say, oh, it's a way we're continuing with Zobotinsky. They have a very specific reading of Zobotinsky and that also Judaize and that adds a lot of religious theological content to Zobotinsky that was not there in the 20s and 30s. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, you're a cultural and intellectual and political history. Jabotinsky played roles in all of those areas, particularly as the founding father really of two of them. Of the revisionist movement that then was the origins of political right. right. Yeah, true. And and I was struck by one of the captions, I don't sorry, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was talking about disentangling. There is so much entangled here, and I think a lot of it goes back to Japanese. You can comment on, let me do this. You can comment on his political views 
as opposed to the campus, in addition to the culture. To the cultural environment. Right. No, it's a great, it's a wonderful question, and it's and it's and, and can, can, yes, because I think I, I think the Dutch is as a as, as a political and cultural right right it is really key to understand it because well. So absolutely, I will answer it the way she Montes was answering questions. Yes and no, right? So while the Jabotinsky has has a huge, you know, casts a huge shadow over Israeli politics and ideology, but at the same time, there are some things that I would push against. So where it, I would say a lot uh, is still relevant, definitely the 1923 Iron Wall uh, essay. And the Iron Wall essay, I strongly recommend everyone to read it and read it not in its abbreviated version that appears on many websites that takes out the illusions in which Jabotinsky explicitly says compares design and civilization to what the col you know, colonialism in, in South America. And he sees it as a colonial situation. He expects the Arab, he respects the Arab for revolting. I mean, if they would just submit I even respect them less. I am expecting them to fight back. That's built into the image of the Iron Wall, uh, and and so that's I. No, it's it's a huge. It's uh, I mean one can talk about it endlessly, and 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 this is where I agree with you that this is a key you know phrase way of seeing the 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 uh, the conflict, but it's also a way to debunk the 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 liberal Zionists. Because for, for Jabotinsky, who is he fighting? What he called the vegetarians in our movement. Now they're thinking that there's a partner on the other side, da, 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 and so on. You know, until you show them the strong fist, there's no partner. Now, after it will be submitted, then we will have a great democracy and with equal representation. So a Jabotinsky will say, yeah, we're still in that project. No, so when exactly there is an expiration date that the Iron Wall was created, right? Uh, we have the Iron Dome, but it's not the Iron Wall yet, right? Where do I put, where will I push back? Jabotinsky died in 1940 while visiting a Baytal camp in New York, in New York, in New York, unexpectedly. Never crowning an heir. A lot of <laughs> Menachem's begging. Uh, career is to create the image that I was crowned, I was continuing. And that's a topic for an entire seminar about the history of revisionist movement. So a lot of the things that we ascribe today to Jabotinsky have much more to do with Menachem Begin, and, um, and, and, and we're mixing both. And, and, and we, how can we not? Because this is, because the Likud actually is more a Menachem Begin uh, creation. And, and I have a long piece about it in, in Hebrew, you know, the return of the great wolf, Ze'ev in Hebrew is wolf. Uh, and then and in a way, I, I, I try to unpack what I just said in, in greater detail. Uh, uh, Ronnie Mali asks, uh, as a cultural historian, how do you see the current mainstream rhetoric in Israeli media? Um, the chapter 14, slide 15. Uh, influencing sentiment of left, right, and center politically as they pertain towards Palestinian Israeli citizens hmm. and those in the occupied territory. Does the gaslighting push us away from dialogue or has it catalyzed the need for dialogue now more than ever? Yeah. Uh, no, it's a complicated question. So I think that part of what, you know, so media in Israel today, mainstream media works in, on two, you know, looks at two type of audiences. One is out, you know, the image reflecting the image towards a non-Israeli audience, but a lot of it is internally. I would argue that internally, a lot of what it wants to show is to bring back confidence in the military. The, I cannot understate how much the October 7 attack was a huge fiasco. And if is, I mean, it's not a place for jokes. I always, but you know, so I say in America, you say in God we trust in the dollar. In Israel, it's in the in the military we trust. You cannot trust the military if people are locked in their safe, you know, uh, spaces, calling for help. And this military that everyone tells us is the greatest power in the Middle East is doing almost nothing. 
you know, and, and I wrote a piece about it, sort of the heroes of October 7th, the day of October 7th, are first responders. It's like 9-11, it's firefighters, it's the medics, they were shot, or even people from the rural areas that did it. And in a way, so a lot of what I think Israeli mainstream media does towards the Israeli audience in Israel is, guys, don't worry, we still have a great army. They're doing their job, they're professionals. And that has to do with an internal Israeli dilemma about what the hell happened there. Because you know, we talked about it, that, that maybe it's too strong of a, of a face, but what happened on October 7th is a state of collapse. The state mechanism collapsed, failed. And in a way, part of what was going on in Israel now is that do you restore faith in that? This goes back to my earlier comment about civil society kicking in, right? The, the volunteers, people are coming in masses to volunteer, cook for those, uh, you know, uh, cook food and donate money and helping these things. This is a beautiful moment in a national spirit, but it shows you that the state mechanism collapsed completely. It's... Uh, um, and so I think that a lot of what's going on in Israel internally now has to do with that, uh, um, um, with that shock. This said, absolutely, if there's something that I find extremely dangerous, there's so many dangers in the, the, the current explosive situation, is I, I'm about to say something very bull. Um, our eyes are set on Gaza for good reasons, but there's a West Bank. And there's in the West Bank, that's a wild west, and this is where it can really become. I'm I'm steering away from using strong words as genocidal. But if you think about as a historian, not as a lawyer of that defines genocide, if you think about atrocities in, in, in ex Yugoslavia, atrocities were always almost 99% of the cases. And if you think about um um Sabla and Shatigla in 1982. It's the, not the regular military. It's always the Falanga. It's always the paramilitary force. It's always a, a unit that is not exactly taking orders from. So what you see in Gaza is awful, but you have a military rank and file, order, discipline of some kind, of some kind. I'm not saying, but at the same time, it allows in other parts to unleash hell and and our and we are so conditioned by the media that no one cares about it apart from a handful of peace activists that are following Bezalem and so on and so forth. So that's part of what I think is going on now. And media plays a huge, huge role in our, you know, this is a televised atrocity, televised massacre on October 7th, televised, it, um, it's hard to keep pace. But part of what is happening is that they're grabbing our attention. And when you grab your attention, it means that you can't see, you can't turn your head and look elsewhere. And that's very dangerous. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a complicated one. I will say the following uh, kind of takes me more to, kind of to political uh, analysis and, and political history. Um, the, the, I mean, part of what happened during the Netanyahu years is that the Israeli issue in the US has turned from a bipartisan issue. So, you know, so a lot of the criticism in Israel against Netanyahu, among many other things, is how did he dare turn something like the, the security of Israel uh, by gambling on one side on the Israel, on the American map? And, and, and this is, we are now, uh, uh, we are seeing the backfire of that, right? So he soured the relationship with American Jews, with uh, our relationship with the, the uh, Democratic Party and so on and so forth. This is on the one level. On the other level, on when was it, October 8th that President Biden gave his uh, uh, speech? The next day, there was a, a, a great 
tell for you know a, a piece in Haaretz, which is like the equivalent of the Israeli New York Times. The Israelis at last received a speech from a politician that is responsible and cares about their future and, and wants them not to suffer. The problem is that it's not a politician from their country, right? So in a way, there's a sentiment in Israel that says, um, especially in the, in the, in the center left, yes, I mean, who, is, who can even question the support of the US? A, Anyone who served in the Israeli military knows how much, you know, you're serving, you know, your, the fighter jets and the jeeps and the, uh, uh, and the rifles are coming from the US. But also, you know, if the catastrophic situation of October 7th could have escalated into a second front, I assume, I don't know, let's talk in 70 years when documents will be declassified, a second front in Lebanon did not open, not because of the great performance of the Israeli military, a nuclear submarine in the Middle East that was sent from Washington. That's the message. So that's, you know, so I, you're taking me outside the realm of cultural history, political analysis. This is where I'll say, let's ask the guys at Brookings Institute and the think tanks in Washington. As, as far as cultural in, references are there, it's a different, it, it works on a different level. One last question. Yes. So, Masha, yes, about the crackdown on speech by pacifists, etc. Could you comment on that? Uh, on that culture of censorship throughout in, in, in Israeli uh, No, it's sad but true. I mean, sort of. Uh, so the situation in it. I mean, um, um, to begin with, you won't be surprised to hear that the ultra right government in Israel always looked like in this country. A lot of the gutter language and the associations that universities are the hotbeds of radicalism. This is the source of evil that predates October 7th. And of course, this is where you have a good excuse to say, hey, that's a time to do it. I would add an important contextual um, element here. The universities didn't, st didn't start. They were about to start their uh, semester on their term. Excuse me. Thank you. On October 7th, basically. So, every, so the universities are on hold uh, and they're postponing and postponing and postponing they might open it on uh, in December. So part of what is going on is that this free speech is not, we're sitting here in a campus and we're thinking about free speech and demonstrations, it's not taking place physically, it's online. So it's all these word, our keyword, keyboard wars that are taking place. Um, you have definitely uh, very alarming very alarming moves by senior administration in, in some Israeli universities, the rector of the University of Haifa, sort of uh, decided that the first thing he will do basically on October 8th or 9th is to start track down what Palestinian students are writing on their social media and call them in for uh, um, uh, to some sort of a disciplinary action. Uh, then it was a backfire that the faculty in his university said how, you know, there's, there's no principle of doing it, uh, you know, how there's no university regulation that allows you to do it. And then it backfired and they were accused of being uh, traitors. Their names were uh, given to Likud members that are started calling them. And uh, sadly, these are close friends. So uh, I, I, I uh, so this crazy dynamic is unfolding. Um, this is on the academic realm, and and yes, definitely, there's there's few uh, very alarming cases. Ran Rolnik, an Israeli psychoanalyst, that was called in to to the to the police because he was writing articles that were critical of the Netanyahu government, and he himself is an expert. He's like the, Israel's biggest expert in Sigmund Freud. So yeah, reminds me of other thing, you know, yeah. other cases in which psychoanalysis was seen as dangerous, right? So, uh, um, so um, um, definitely uh, the, the, the legal dimension, which is critical to bear in mind, which is very dangerous, is that Israel has emergency laws that were never canceled. So here we have First Amendment, here we have tensions, we have uh, legally, the interest of the ultra-right government in Israel is to use the legal apparatus it has to stifle free speech. And there are definitely first signs that are doing it. And like the first question, 
Is it surprising? No. Is it alarming? The scales and the speed? Very much so.